Good evening, everyone. My name is David Elwood, and I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. It is my very great honor to uh, welcome back our speaker, Robert Zellick, um, who's going to speak on economics and security and American foreign policy back to the future. Um, before I continue, I do want to acknowledge the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and the Institute of Politics, who did a great deal to make this all possible. Now, Bob Zellick has uh, professed that public policy is, quote, the art of the possible. And while it's necessary to spend time evaluating and analyzing, predicting outcomes, and so forth, uh, it also should be about getting stuff done. And I can't imagine someone who has spent more time, more successfully, getting stuff done in a very complex uh, global arena. You know, most recently, he has been the president of the World Bank. But, um, and of course, in that capacity, you have, uh, you've got a link scholarship to real world practice, to diplomacy, international economics. He served during pretty bad economic crisis and a huge array of things going on. But to really appreciate his capacities and so forth. I guess, uh, well, basically alphabet soup is what you, you need to describe him. NAFTA, WTO, G7, Doha, APEC, and so forth. All of these are organizations that he has been centrally engaged with and involved in. Uh, he grew up in uh, Naperville, Illinois, and went to Swarthmore. And here's the important part. He got a magna cum laude from Harvard Law School none of which was of any use to him whatsoever until he got an MPP from the Kennedy School in 1981. <laughs> this allowed him to put it all together. Uh, one of his professors, uh, Dick Darman, while he was here at the Kennedy School, went to work in the Reagan administration and uh, uh, got a, um, uh, he was deputy and became deputy assistant secretary for financial institutions and served as counselor to James Baker in the Treasury Department. Darman called him a rare combination of macro conceptualizer, detail man, policy analyst, and politician. Um, so throughout then a series of administrations, he's been in various critical positions. Under the President George W. H. W. Bush, he was appointed Under Secretary of State, and after the fall of the Berlin Wall, he was named as a representative to German reunification talks uh, in 1990. He's widely credited as one of the key architects of the two plus four diplomatic negotiations that led to the peaceful reunification of West and East Germany uh, while assuaging French, British, and Soviet apprehension. Uh, later in the administration, he became deputy chief of staff and assistant to the president. Uh, he was appointed by the president as the personal representative or Sherpa for preparation for the G7 and G8 uh, summits and instrumental in sealing NAFTA deal uh, uh, later with Mexico. Um, he left then for a, a period in the private sector, working actually for, for Fannie Mae. Um, and then he was one of George W. Bush's uh, top foreign policy advisors uh, in 2000. He, in five remarkable years as the US trade representative, USTR, he completed negotiations that brought China and Taiwan into the World Trade Organization, developed a framework for new global markets. Well, you get the idea. Um, and at the outset, he was named De uh, President Bush's second term. He became Deputy Secretary of State, where he was a, a Chief Operating Officer, and then uh, he, where he played a pivotal role in, role in negotiating the peace accord between um, the government of Sudan uh, and the uh, Sudan Liberation Army that was signed in Nigeria in 2006. After a brief stint at Goldman Sachs, he then went to the World Bank and uh, has been uh, deeply involved in everything from negotiations over what to do during the financial crisis, but much more important, focusing on making it a more accountable, responsible, flexible, and transparent organization. In short, uh, this is a man who represents all the things that we hope um, many of you uh, do and can become uh, as, uh, as you go forward in life. So please join me in welcoming Robert Zell. Well, thank you, David, for that overly generous introduction. I feel like I've heard my funeral oration. Uh, <laughs> I, I very much appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here with all of you uh, this evening. Uh, as a former student at the Kennedy School, a senior fellow at the Belfer Center, um, and the longtime beneficiary of many contributions by Kennedy School scholars and students, I'm delighted to be here to share some ideas on a topic that I've been pondering for a while. 
This evening, I'll offer a strategic perspective on the connection between economics and security. In doing so, uh, even as we look ahead, I'll draw on an earlier American foreign policy tradition to offer a revision to the standard post-World War II history. So let me start with an anecdote that helped crystallize my thinking. Earlier this year, Bob Carr, Australia's foreign minister and a longtime friend of the United States, observed with Aussie clarity, the United States, he said, is one budget deal away from restoring its global preeminence. And he added a caution. There are powers in the Asia Pacific that are whispering that this time the United States will not get its act together, so others had best attend to them. Now, Bob Carr is the founder of the Chester A. Arthur Society, which is named after America's not so renowned 21st president, and a proud assembly of Australians who appreciate obscure U.S. political history and humor. So Carr would probably not be surprised to learn that his warning echoes words that Alexander Hamilton drafted for President George Washington's farewell address, that the new nation must cherish credit as a means of strength and security. Ironically, it took an admiral, Mike Mullen, then chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, to recall Hamilton's warning about the linkage between credit and security. Mullen seized attention by pointing out not a danger to the fleet, but by telling CNN the most significant threat to our national security is our debt. Now, Mullen's observation should not come as a surprise because strategists in uniform often look to history as their laboratory, and they need to match means and capabilities to achieve ends. Officers at staff colleges may be inspired by exciting chapters on Napoleon's bold campaigns or the Royal Navy's counter-strikes, but the astute also discover that the key to Britain's victories in the Napoleonic Wars is found in those dry accounts of William Pitt the Younger's budgets, because by restoring Britain's credit after its costly imbroglio with the American colonies, Pitt enabled his country to fight a long war and even repeatedly finance coalition partners without choking Britain's economy. Yet America's security strategists seem to have lost the ability to integrate economics into foreign policy. The usual security perspectives on economics do not extend much beyond sanctions policies or how to pay for defense budgets. At best, the role of economics is assumed. It's not analyzed. We scarcely understand its effect on power, influence, diplomacy, ideas, and human rights. And at worst, economic problems have become a justification for a come-home America isolationism. And the economists, absorbed with their mathematical models, are content to operate in their separate universe. Some, on the left and on the right, disparage the role of economics in foreign policy as crass commercialism or narrow business interests, or worse, affording undue influence to bankers. Others view international economics and trade policy as narrow specialties involving technical negotiations that just aggravate domestic constituencies. Yet this separation of economics from U.S. foreign and security policy reflects a shift from earlier American experience. For its first 150 years, the American foreign policy tradition was deeply infused with economic logic. Unfortunately, thinking about international political economy has become a lost art in the United States. So it's time to look back to the future. Now, as some of you may recall, in 1773, a tribe of Bostonians threw 342 chests of tea into the harbor, without damaging other property, I should add, to protest taxes imposed to bail out the nearly bankrupt East India Company. And their protest still inspires a political movement in our time. This incident was the most dramatic of waves of colonial non-importation policies during the 1760s, early American efforts to employ trade as a tool of policy. Now, the new American Republic was born amidst a world of mercantilist empires. Navigating around the trading monopolies of seasoned established powers, and later some blockades and bullying, the former colony sought continually 
for freedom to trade. This principle was not free trade as we understand it today, but it definitely was a challenge to the old order. The young United States, under President Thomas Jefferson, tried to exert leverage of its own with non-importation acts and even a disastrous embargo on foreign commerce in 1807 to pressure Britain on neutral trade and the impressment of American sailors. Ironically, it took the failure of those American trade sanctions and the War of 1812 for the United States to start to develop the manufacturing base that Hamilton sought and Jefferson had opposed. Now, Britain was not the only object of the U.S.'s economic security policy. From 1801 to 1805, in the face of the Barbary pirates' attacks on U.S. ships, Jefferson rejected demands for tribute and instead sent the U.S. Navy to the shores of Tripoli. As the U.S. Marine Corps hymn is memorialized, this Libyan expedition was not led from behind. In an age where power arose from territory, resources, and people, and then commerce, the implicit American strategy understandably concentrated on the North American continent and on open immigration. Land and settlement provided security. Wielding a lost tool of diplomacy, the United States resolved disputes by buying lands. Louisiana, Florida, Old New Mexico, California, the Gadsden Purchase, Alaska, even the Virgin Islands at the start of the 20th century. Admittedly, in some cases, use of force led to some price discounts. And in another touch of irony, Jefferson needed Hamilton's Bank of the United States and his credit system, which Jefferson had opposed for his greatest achievement, the Louisiana Purchase. The theme of Western Hemispheric integration, a partnership of young democracies, not an empire, was advanced by Secretary of State Henry Clay in the 1820s, it was then revived in the 1880s and 90s, and it found its first fruits a century later with NAFTA, and then five more free trade agreements the U.S. made with Latin America. And today, those free trade agreements encompass over half the hemisphere's non-U.S. GDP. In the 21st century, comprehensive free trade agreements could turn out to be ties that bind like alliances of old. The Federalist Papers, the touchstone of American constitutionalism, are replete with references to the need to have a strong federal government to secure the United States' place among foreign nations, including through healthy commerce and credit. Indeed, John Jay cautioned in 1787 that the growing trade with China would one day draw the United States into conflict in the Far East. The United States' first forays into international relations were called treaties of amity and commerce. Now, as a maritime country, the U.S. Navy looms especially large in America's foreign economic policy. In 1854, Commodore Matthew Perry opened Japan to trade. By 1899, Secretary of State John Hay was resisting carving up China as Africa had been, in favor of an open-door policy to secure equal commercial opportunity. Now, this race through U.S. foreign economic policy is not intended to suggest that the American system was all peaceful commerce. To the contrary, even if the connection was driven by interests and not by explicit planning, the economic and security policies worked hand in hand. And these interests were often infused with a healthy dose of what those generations called spreading civilization, and which we call values. With trade in the flag came missionaries and their schools. After the defeat of the Boxer Rebellion in 1900, the United States pragmatically used its share of the indemnity imposed on China, which the United States had opposed, to found Tsinghua University in Beijing the university, I might add, of Xi Jinping, and fund scholarships for Chinese students in the United States. As the United States settled its home continent around the opening of the 20th century, a debate arose about expansion to territories beyond U.S. shores. Some wanted markets or coaling stations. Others sought to carry civilization, as they called it, to foreign peoples. And some simply wanted to keep strategic places out of the hands of others. But imperialism didn't sit well with many Americans, who proudly recalled that their nation had freed itself from old empires. The U.S. war with Spain in 1898, which was precipitated by conflicts over Cuba, 
led the United States to acquire the Philippines for $20 million to keep those islands from being grabbed by others whose fleets were hovering. But the United States didn't take Cuba. Teddy Roosevelt stirred up a revolt in Panama so he could build a canal that linked the two great oceans, commerce, and fleets of the U.S. Navy. The American foreign economic policy helped spur early interest in international law, what we now awkwardly call rules-based systems, to help resolve disputes. The United States was a very active participant in the first Hague Conference of 1899 and lent its support to the Permanent Court of International Arbitration. Secretary of State Elihu Root negotiated arbitration treaties with 25 countries early in the 20th century. And the decades that followed continued the pattern. Dollar diplomacy sought to support American enterprises in Latin America and East Asia through what we now call transnational actors, but in those days were railroad and mining engineers, bankers, and merchants. In World War I, Great Britain wisely learned a lesson from a century before and shrewdly played on the U.S. commitment to neutral rights on the seas. After World War I, reacting against what the United States viewed as the old European politics of perpetuated hostilities, the country withdrew from European military security. And even during the 1920s and 30s, the United States relied on banker statesmen to negotiate debt, reparations, in Europe and Mexico to try to revive broken economies. And to secure peaceful seas, the United States even launched the idea of global arms control through the naval disarmament conferences of the 1920s. In the depths of the Great Depression, however, the United States withdrew from the world economy and political military isolationism followed. Then came 1941, and the United States again learned through harsh experience that economic and security interdependence were linked. The United States had imposed embargoes on the sale of petroleum and scrap iron to Japan in response to Japan's invasion of China and its threats to Southeast Asia. Imperial Japan responded with a surprise attack, in part to secure its sources of oil and raw materials. The United States, caught unprepared, paid a terrible price. Now, World War II and the opening of the Cold War led to a sharp break in this American foreign policy tradition. At least that's the impression left by masters of mid-20th century security studies. In their narrative, the dawn of the nuclear age, the face-off between communism and the West, required a new approach, a national security strategy. Understandably, in a world of superpower confrontation and containment, the traditional American foreign policy aims of amity and commerce seem quaint, outdated. For the first time in its history, the United States maintained a large conventional army, a significant part based in Europe, and other troops fighting in East Asia in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and in Southwest Asia in the 90s and for the past decade. Instead of Milton Friedman's idea that economic freedom is an end in and of itself, and an indispensable means towards achieving political freedom, economics became a resource factor in the national security state, and economics became the handmaiden to the strategic policy process. The U.S. National Security Act of 1947 is full of references to new offices to manage the mobilization of people and resources for total war. Yet the act didn't even make the Secretary of the Treasury a statutory member of the new National Security Council. And ever since that time, the U.S. government has struggled to integrate economics into its national security strategies. The transformation of U.S. foreign policy priorities from a fusion of economics and security to a national security policy signaled a change in the training of the stewards of American foreign policy. The new specialties were Soviet studies, political military affairs, defense policy, and eventually Middle East policy. Short of homegrown talent on the central front, America even outsourced its security strategy to immigrants from continental Europe. Henry Kissinger, Spignu Brzezinski, who had grown up in a world of threat and power balance in Eurasia. We need to rewrite economics back into the narrative of the Cold War and all that follows. We need a fuller appreciation of the links between economic and security to match 
today's times. The world continues to struggle through a global economic crisis that began in the United States. Fears, fragilities, and failures are fueling tensions within and among countries. Leaders are under protectionist and nationalist pressures in trade, but also regarding currencies, investments, resources, islands, and oceans. These frictions risk a downward economic spiral and even possibly conflict. So to better appreciate the political economy story and its significance for security, it's helpful to consider three phases since the end of World War II. From the creation of the Bretton Woods system in 1944 to its breakdown in 1970, then a capitalist revival from the late 70s through the end of the Cold War, and on to the rise of globalization in the 1990s, extending to the crash of 2008. We're now stumbling into a new fourth phase that is vital for the United States to shape. Even as World War II still raged, the United States and Great Britain and other countries met at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire to begin creating new international economic institutions to address currency exchange rates, trade, reconstruction, and development. The United States and Europe launched the Marshall Plan, and Europe created an economic community to shore up the economic foundations of the free world. The United States exported capital and it imported goods to boost recoveries in Europe, Japan, and then Korea and others in the developing world. The economic internationalists of Bretton Woods and the European community were not driven primarily by a plan for containment or to counter the Soviet Union. That came a bit later. Indeed, one of the prime architects of the Bretton Woods institutions, Harry Dexter White, was later doomed because he was seen as being too sympathetic with the Soviet Union. These strategists were trying to counter the economic causes of political and security breakdown in the 1920s and 1930s. Only over time did the imperative of the Cold War lead to a pragmatic convergence of the national security planners and the economic designers. Yet there's a crucial difference in the way the 20th century national security model embraced economics. The national security focus on resources of the state treated international economic issues as benefits to be exchanged to support security aims. Trade concessions, foreign assistance, military aid, not necessarily inclusive growth, good governance, and open competitive markets. Now this difference is important. The national security perspective of state power risks overlooking a very important reality that sound economic policies are the underpinnings of both individual freedom and national power, not only military power, but also the dynamism, innovation, and influence of an economy and a society. The 20th century concept of national security also overlooked how economic change within economies and internationally can become a powerful force of its own in international relations. Now, President Eisenhower understood this distinction. He invested political capital in balanced budgets, low taxes, sound monetary policies. He recognized the underlying strength generated by investments in national highways, education, and science. On the international stage, as Anthony Eden learned to his sorrow in the Suez Crisis of 1956, Eisenhower even used the power of the US dollar over the British pound to stop the use of force in Egypt. Now in 1970s, a new generation of international relations thinkers, led by Robert Cohane and Joseph Nye of the Kennedy School, questioned the realist power of Hans Morgenthau that had accompanied, accompanied the Cold War national security concept. They didn't dismiss power, and indeed they recognized the vital role of military force. But Cohane and Nye sought to supplement realism with a description of complex interdependence, including economics and their attention to diverse regimes and international organizations was especially timely because this was the period of the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates and the rise of oil power through OPEC in the 1970s. Thus, during the 1970s, the first phase of the World War II international economic system came to a messy close, and the world economy began to stumble towards a new reality of floating exchange rates, oil shocks, big bank loans of petrodollars to the developing world sovereigns, 
and stagflation. It's intriguing to me that Henry Kissinger, the master strategist of classic realism, struggled to integrate these seminal economic events into his Weltanschauung. Some critics even argued that Dr. Kissinger's lack of understanding of economics led to a balancing strategy based on the assumption of a Spenglerian decline of the West. But from the national security perspective, Kissinger had shrewdly extricated the United States from military defeat in Vietnam while opening relations with China as a counterweight to the Soviet Union. Now, Kohane and Nye recognized that they had a blind spot too. As presenters of a framework for using international factors to explain change and stability in world politics, they acknowledged they didn't examine the connection between domestic and foreign policies. They focused on international systems, rules, norms, regimes, yet critical domestic choices, particularly economic ones, will infuse foreign policy and shape, for good or ill, the principles and practices and diplomacy of the international systems. Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan understood intuitively the connection between national economic revival and foreign policy. So their priority was to revive capitalism at home so as to extend it to the world. And in doing so, they defined a second phase of the post-war international economy. Now the promotion of global capitalism seemed to many to be disruptive. It was the antithesis of rebuilding an international economic system that was reeling from these 70s shocks. After all, Joseph Schumpeter had explained that capitalism is creative destruction. Yet this very disruptive quality enables capitalism to respond flexibly and continually to technological and other changes. Now the reform of capitalism wasn't just an Anglo-American venture. Germany's commitment to sound economic policies and export competitiveness demonstrated that the social market economy of Germany can work. And East Germans saw the contrast with their existence. Japanese manufacturers responded to oil shocks with huge increases in energy efficiency. So together, the domestic economic policies of these trilateral partners enabled the West to adjust to the 1970s breakdown of the post-World War II economic security system. The Soviet Union could not adapt to its economic challenges. The USSR couldn't cope with change in information technology, new drivers of productivity and competitiveness, and eventually $15 a barrel oil. So the combination of the democracy's economic regeneration, the US military buildup with advanced technologies, and transatlantic solidarity over Euro missiles led Mikhail Gorbachev to conclude he had to reform communism. But his perestroika didn't work. Reagan believed that the regimes and institutions of interdependence should be tested for effectiveness in boosting international growth, opportunity, and human rights. After all, those were the standards of economic freedom that he was trying to apply at home. And moreover, at a time of economic flux, the international regimes needed to allow flexibility, adaptation. And Reagan believed that the international rules definitely should not constrict domestic economic revival. So Reagan saw the link between the national and international. His administration worked to shape the post-war international system after the 1970s upheaval. Now at first, the US drew some very strong criticism by rejecting some international schemes. UNESCO's New World Information Order, the UN General Assembly had proposed a new international economic order, and the big debate about the deep seabed mining regime and the Law of the Sea Treaty. Still, after a pause, the United States would lead in reshaping the international economic relations. In 1985, Secretary of the Treasury James Baker launched a process of international economic coordination through the G7. The United States steered the IMF to a new role in the Latin American debt crisis in the late 1980s. It led to a major recapitalization of the World Bank to support the developing country's economic reforms and debt rescheduling until banks could write down their losses. Under President Reagan, the United States pushed to expand global trade through the launch of the Uruguay Round completed much of that negotiation under President George H.W. Bush, and then it closed the deal to create the World Trade Organization under President Bill Clinton. President George H.W. Bush helped launch APEC to foster economic ties across the Pacific after the end of the Cold War, and he negotiated NAFTA, which President Clinton enacted. 
So the end of the Cold War and its immediate aftermath brought the second phase of the post-war international economy to a close with astounding success. The national security aims of the Cold War in Europe were achieved with hardly a shot being fired. And it may not be coincidental that the principal U.S. of Secretaries of State in this period, George Shultz and James Baker, had served as Secretaries of the Treasury too. Now the huge changes in the world economy in the 1990s precipitated yet a third phase in the post-war international economic system. The end of the Cold War reunited Europe. The European community became a deeper and a wider union, and some of its members even launched a common currency. Just as important, China, India, and other developing economies moved from planned socialism and import substitution to market competition. Over the course of just a decade, the number of people engaged in or actively affected by the world market economy surged from about one billion to four or five times that. Information technology leapt ahead. Capital raced around the globe. And during the 1990s, the earlier era of globalization before World War I seemed to offer much closer policy parallel than did the world economy of Bretton Woods. Yet adaptation to markets on a truly global scale, integrating developed and developing countries alike, was bound to be discontinuous and fraught with challenges. In the late 1990s, countries in East Asia and Latin America faced harsh financial blows and painful restructuring. Almost all are now stronger for that experience. The recovery strategies of some of the developing countries planted the seeds of a new problem, imbalances, whether of savings, reserves, trade accounts, or other dimensions. And some economists maintain that the low prices of goods available from the new suppliers led central bankers to persist in easy monetary policies for too long, risking widespread asset price inflation, especially in the real estate markets. And then the bubbles burst. The institutions of the international economic system adapted incrementally in the 1990s and often with difficulty. The economic firefighting of the IMF and the World Bank made them principal targets of an anti-globalization movement. The continuing boom then almost put the IMF out of business. And unfortunately, neither international nor domestic or supervisors of financial markets kept up with the innovations or the frauds and foolishness that inevitably come with long boom periods. The WTO added many new members, and the trading system even withstood terrorist attacks and fears of more to come. But the travails of the Doha round of the WTO, launched in 2001, signaled a new challenge. The traditional developed economies wanted the middle-income countries, China, Brazil, India, and others, to assume more responsibility for lowering barriers to trade, while all would offer special treatment to Africa and the poorest. The major developing countries, in turn, pointed to their large numbers of poor people and wanted to maintain the privileges of special and differential treatment. This debate is far from resolved, and it not only reverberates in trade, but you will see it in monetary affairs, investment, development, energy, and the environment. The September 11th attacks concentrated America's attention on terrorism, <clears throat> homeland security, and the long wars that followed. Yet the connection of economics to the new security threats was also strong. When Al-Qaeda targeted the United States, it aimed for the World Trade Center, the twin symbols of American capitalism, as well as Washington. In addition to shock and destruction, the terrorists wanted to strangle political and economic freedom. As Osama bin Laden boasted in 2004, his aim was bleeding America to the point of bankruptcy. So even as America fought in Iraq and Afghanistan and against terrorist threats around the globe, other forces of history did not stand still. China, India, and other emerging economies began to change the landscape of power. The failed political and stunted economic systems of North Africa and the Middle East spark upheavals that will shake the region for a generation. Now the crash of 2008 has ushered in a fourth phase. Global financial capitalism and our countries face a new crisis. The advanced economies are struggling to reduce debt, revive jobs and productivity through structural reforms. Unemployment is up, confidence is down, protectionism is rising, 
Publics are anxious. Politicians are struggling. Developing economies have been hit too, although many have fared relatively better. And the 60-year-long leadership of developed economies is now in question. Will the Eurozone and the historic success of Europe's peaceful integration survive, and with it, Europe's influence in the world? Will the middle-income developing countries, some of which are rising powers, overcome the so-called middle-income trap to become high-income countries and responsible stakeholders in an international system that has benefited them but that they didn't design? Will the poorest, the so-called bottom billion, have an opportunity to prosper too, or will they be breeding grounds for transnational insecurities? Will the new political systems of the Middle East and North Africa lead to new economic policies for inclusive growth and peaceful integration in the world economy? Will the United States show leadership at home and internationally in reviving its economic strength while simultaneously leveraging its capabilities through an activist economic diplomacy, including a revived push for free trade? Will the United States connect its foreign economic policy with security interests and freedom of the seas, open skies, protection of cyberspace? In his classic study, The World in Depression, 1929 to 39, Charles Kindleberger argued that it was critical for one major power to take the lead in shaping the international economic system. This power could not dictate, but instead needed to invest in encouraging a shared approach to trade, capital flows, currencies, and reliance on markets. And Kindleberger described how during the Great Depression, the United States had the means, but not the will to lead, while Britain had the will, but no longer the means. If the United States does not lead now, who will? Bob Carr's warning about the United States' need to resolve its budget mess is correct. The United States must restore its credit for its own health and to enable it to lead. Without healthy economic growth, the United States will be unable to lead. And just as dangerously, the United States will lose its identity on the global stage if it loses its economic dynamism. America's unique strength is the ability to reinvent itself. So, so the United States does not need just any budget deal. It needs one that rebuilds the fundamentals of long-term growth. It needs to limit government spending. It needs to encourage private sector innovation and productivity. And it needs inclusive growth, which empowers all its citizens to fulfill their potential. Through twists and turns, the American experience has demonstrated that its greatest asset is its openness to ideas, goods, capital, people, and change. Every country makes mistakes, but open countries are quicker to correct theirs and then to forge ahead. And that's what the United States needs to do now. Thank you. We have four microphones. There's one right here, another there, another here, and another here. Uh, those of you who would like to ask questions, I urge you to line up. And I'd also ask that you recall uh, what a good question is here at the Kennedy School. First, uh, you start by identifying yourself. Second, it is short and contains one thought. That's one per customer. And finally, it ends with a question mark. Thank you very much. Start right over here. Hi. Thank you very much for visiting us here. My name is John Soilu. I am a sophomore at the college. And I wanted to ask about the European sovereign debt crisis. Do you think the U.S. is doing what it uh, can? And if not, what else can the U.S. do? Um, <clears throat> that's a very good question. Um, but I think it, I, it would start with a bit of a description of the challenge that Europe faces. And I think one of the reasons why this is a particularly compounding problem is you really have three interconnected issues. You have an issue of sovereign debt. You have an issue of the banking system, which is connected to the sovereign debt, because many of the banks own the sovereign debt. And for some countries, there's an issue of competitiveness in the context of a single currency. And what I think we've seen happen over time is Europe has um, gone to the brink uh, multiple times. And authorities, often the monetary authorities, add liquidity to the system which buys time but doesn't resolve the fundamental problem. 
And so I think that uh, Mario Draghi of the European Central Bank, who's somebody I know well and respect and admire, has tried to offer a pathway. But we're now into a different dimension. We're into the politics of reform. It kind of fits my overall theme here. It's not just pure economics. It's being able to handle the politics. And <clears throat> I think to, in a sense, there's three things that have to be done. One, the Germans are half right. You need serious reforms of both a fiscal nature and a structural nature. And in my sense, the ground zero is Spain and Italy, uh, because those will be the countries that determine whether this succeeds or not. But the second point is there's a mismatch between the time that the reforms will take effect and the need to roll over your debt. So there are a variety of methods out there where you can sort of manage the cost of debt or lower the cost of debt if the reforms are made. And third, you'd have to recapitalize uh, the banking system going forward. Um, obviously, Germany is the country that plays the key role in this. Um, I think many American audiences often uh, underestimate the Germany, Germans' commitment to Europe, and so I have no reason to doubt Chancellor Merkel or uh, Minister Schäuble, the finance minister, when they say that they will do what it takes. But, and this is the interesting political piece, I worry that because this crisis will run for a longer period of time, that uh, there's the danger of miscalculation or lack of room to maneuver. And you can see in German politics with the Constitutional Court, you can see with um, the, the German, the Bundesbank, which has high stature in its position. And you can actually pick up from, sometimes from German friends, about the frustration of being the one that has to pay the bills while being criticized. So to connect this to your question about the US, I think the US has actually done more than people have recognized through the Federal Reserve's swap lines, because what's happened is it's often hard to borrow dollars in this. Environment. But it's quite interesting that the US is often reluctant to talk about this because of whether it would be politically acceptable to be seen as bailing out Europe. And so, again, one of the things I tried to pose here is what I, I think it'd be useful for the U.S. going ahead to see what other things might the U.S. do that would actually help support the structural reforms. Some people have talked about um, a broader free trade agreement between the U.S. and the European Union. There are complexities into this. I've dealt with a lot of the negotiations, but I think uh, the Germans have, have actually suggested the idea it would be something worth trying to explore to see whether that transatlantic economic community could support the structural reforms that need to be in both countries. I happen to think this is true for Japan uh, as well. Um, and so while ultimately I think Europe is a wealthy continent and should be able to deal with these issues itself, your question raises this very key point about whether the United States as a leader in the system can feel comfortable in trying to, to determine ways to support the Europeans as they move forward the process. And I think, uh, frankly, they, this is an area where I, I actually hope that whichever administration is in power that people take seriously because one, one thing just to think about, if you listen to some of the campaign debates in the, in the Republican primaries, uh, you hear foreign policy questions, and there wasn't one question I remember about the Eurozone. And if you think about it, one of the greatest foreign policy achievements of the past 60 years was to end the fighting of wars on the European continent and instead the historical integration that becomes a close American ally. So is that a foreign policy issue or is that an economic issue? Thank you. Right up here. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Sita Gofar and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for your very fascinating and uh, insightful address. Um, you mentioned the... Um, You'll go far. What? <laughs> just just uh, uh, You mentioned um, the relationship between China and the U.S. many times in your address, um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. Um, obviously, on the campaign trail, and as we'll probably see tomorrow, we've heard strong rhetoric from both sides saying that they'll, quote-unquote, get tough on China, crack down on Chinese um, tariffs and other import regulations. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of people concerned over what types of implications that could have on our foreign policy with China. Um, so I wanted to ask you, um, how do you see our foreign policy priorities and our economic priorities with China uh, interacting? And if you were to advise the White House, for example, what type of prescription uh, would you recommend in terms of policy suggestions? Um, this is going to be a huge issue for the next 10 years, so not only for this president, but any next president. 
uh, Joe Nye wrote a piece a number of years ago um, relating to Thucydides and the causes of the Peloponnesian Wars and the rise of a, of a new power. But yet it's complicated by something I alluded to, whether it's China or India or Brazil. It's still a power that is relatively poor. And so the sharing of responsibilities in the system looks a little different if you're sitting in Beijing or Delhi or Brasilia than it does uh, from the Washington context. I think uh, in general with diplomacy, it's best to try to explore finding mutual interests. And one of the last things I did at the World Bank was a project called China 2030. And it was a look with the Chinese at the structural reforms that China would need. And an interesting story of this because the bank had a very, has a very good brand in China. At various points over the past 30 years, it had done analytical work at critical points. It has nothing to do with financing. It's an analytical process. And this rather extensive report we did with the DRC, which is the primary think tank under the state council, really identified the fact that China's reform or, or economic growth process for all its success over the past 30 years is going to have to shift. It's going to have to shift to increasing domestic demand. It's going to have to shift to increasing consumption. You have uh, more people leaving the labor force in the next five years than coming in. It's going to have to move up the value added chain. There's questions of fiscal federalism, innovation. Now, one of the things that can drive increased productivity, and this is not only true for China, it's true for other countries, is opening your service sector. So there are many areas in that report that would show something that could help China with its growth, but also would be of advantage to the United States uh, in, in advanced economies. Frankly, if they're going to have an innovation economy, they're going to have to protect intellectual property rights better, which is also one of the U.S. complaints. So I guess my starting point would be to try to find the commonalities of interest uh, with China. And to give you one other little insight on this, um, I think where the real problem is going to come is there are economic tensions and we have to be careful. Those can slip out of control. China's going through a political transition just as the United States. Uh, I was just in Taiwan, Korea, and Singapore last week. You can feel the sensitivities of think nationalism and with the islands disputes that you read about. I'm hopeful or at least would like to believe that on the economic side there's a large network of ties between uh, U.S., Europeans, Chinese economic community. What I'm more worried about is on the political military side. You've got a disconnect where the People's Liberation Army reports to the Central Military Commission. There's only two civilians on that, President Hu and Xi Jinping. And from my experience, even my sort of foreign policy counterparts on the State Council above the Foreign Ministry were often not in a position to shape the PLA's security policies until they were taken. So until after somebody had gotten in a dispute or shot down a satellite. That I think creates an institutional problem because what we really need is a sort of political military dialogue, not just a military military dialogue. And the Chinese system isn't really susceptible to this. I made this point in both the United States and China. Maybe it's something that can be acted on. So it, I think um, the, the rising power of the Chinese economy definitely plays into the politics you've talked about. But the other side of it is, you know, I, I spoke to the National Governors Association uh, shortly after leaving the bank. The governor's view of foreign investment and Chinese investment is a little different than you hear from Congress. They would actually like the investment. They'd like to be able to bring in the jobs and the marketing network. So part of the challenge, again, from American policy is, yes, we have to be firm to defend positions and rights and take WTO actions as appropriate. But we also have to be careful not to blame our problems on others. And we actually have to clean up our act first. And then we can use that to try to find these mutual interests. And where you don't, where you still have differences, is in some of the security topics, you have to try to manage them as best you can. Because one thing I know for sure is that if the United States, through a process of, uh, of, of our own frustrations or in overreaction, or if it's led by the Chinese side, leads to a security conflict or tension with China, you have got a totally different world. And people in East Asia do not want it. They're, they're happy to have a balance. They certainly don't want containment. Thank you. Right up here. Hi, Robert. Thank you for coming back to the Kennedy School. It's always good to see another MPP is doing wonderful things like leading the World Bank. <laughs> My name is Juan Tellez Sandoval, and I'm an MPP one right now. I have a question. Um, 
regarding the international where are you institutions. From? Oh, sorry, I'm from Mexico. Yes. So, uh, in the last couple of decades, mostly uh, the UN, the IMF, and the World Bank have been receiving increasing criticism from the developing world, from medium academians, uh, people here at Harvard, even, and so on, uh, accused of sometimes doing more damage than the help they are supposed to do, and so on. And my question is really like if you think uh, the organizations as they are now can deal with today's problems or they need like a complete reform or something. And the other thing is that I hear from each other that your relations between one another are not always the best. And so if there's like any master plan between the three of you to cooperate closely together or something. Um, of the three, the IMF and World Bank from their creation work more closely together. They're right across the street from one another. But they do have different focuses and missions. In a sense, the, the World Bank really focuses more on the microeconomic basis of reforms where the IMF is sort of the macroeconomic uh, player, prime player. And I have no doubt that the criticisms you mentioned continue. I tended to see, but it may be where I sat, that some of that has dissipated from some of the anti-globalization movement. It might have been partly the response we had in the financial crisis. So in brief, the answer to your question is those institutions have to modernize themselves. Look at how the world is transformed from the world I described of their creation. Now there's lots of ways you want to modernize yourself. So one thing is uh, the need to be faster and more flexible. So before the financial crisis, there was a food crisis. And one of the things I tried to do at the bank was to put together, in a sense, an emergency financing facility to help with either sort of pet or food or seed needs. That was seen as very responsive to some of the countries under greatest threat. Um, we also need to adapt and innovate. So we work very closely with Mexico, for example, on a series of uh, things to do with earthquake insurance and some of the, the aspects of climate change where we did some special programs with the bus system in Mexico City. So that is part of the idea of seeing countries as clients. Recognize that client needs vary and trying to have an interactive process to use knowledge and learning from around the world plus financing to help your client. Now Mexico is a good example of another uh, sort of case of this. Mexico, as you probably know, developed the Opportunatus program. In Brazil, it's the Bolsa Familia. These are conditional cash transfer programs that go to the bottom 15 or 20 percent based on the money being conditioned on children going to school and, and people getting health checkups. The World Bank helped expand those to 40 other countries, and we are trying to develop a broad safety net uh, for, for all countries, depending on their capacity. So, the world of hierarchy of the old sort of mid 20th century has changed to a much more network system. And so how the World Bank does business, the openness of the information systems we had, and also the personnel. So one of the things that I tried to do in my tenure was uh, by the time I left, we had 50% of the officers were women and a much larger percentage from the developing world. And I tried to bring in developing world people in more sort of senior positions. I think it made for a better bank and made for added perspectives and also added to the buy-in. And so uh, part of the challenge of these institutions, like a university, like a private one, is yes, you must continue to adapt and change. I think, but again, you know, I have a biased view. By the time I left, I found that there was actually a pretty good response of some of these. And I talked about the example of China. Here's a country that's grown pretty well. And again, I, as I mentioned, China is not at all ashamed or objecting to the advice of the World Bank. It actually wanted to engage it. And so, I mean, you're from Mexico. Frankly, our relationship with the Mexican team from Augustine Carstens and the finance ministers, the presidents were very, very good. And I hope that my successors will have a chance to work with President Peñanita. Because again, I actually think there's a wonderful North American opportunity out of some of the changes in energy and, and some of the changes in China. Right here. Good evening, thank you for speaking with us. Uh, my name is Rajko Radovanovic. I'm a freshman at the college, I'm American Yugoslav. Um, I have a question on behalf of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Uh, I was wondering what your opinion is. This is an organized system. <laughs> I was wondering what your opinion is on the scale of costs of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars and striking a balance between maintaining a viable national budget whilst responding to global threats in the U.S. for the U.S. Uh, excellent question. I guess I'd start out by saying the first obligation under the Constitution and for most societies is the security 
and the national security. And so um, I don't believe money should be wasted. I used the example of President Eisenhower, somebody who actually watched the defense budget very closely and took a different approach. Um, but uh, I think that in a period of change, uh, the United States' security outlook is going to have to change with the system. And uh, I don't want to prejudge this, but I would not at all be surprised that coming out of the era of the long ground wars, that you're going to see an increased focus on the notion of the U.S.'s traditional position as a maritime power with Eurasia. You already see this with discussions of air-sea battle concepts as opposed to air-land sort of battle concepts. Um, now, the Army is going to resist this and is, is going to make its case uh, for resources, but I think one of the challenges, again, for future President and Secretary of Defense is how to allocate resources that are still under pressure and limited to provide that security for the overall system. And there's another dimension of this that reflects economics in the other sense, and that is, you know, without trying to overstate it, the United States has provided a lot of security for the past 60 years, and it's been treated as a free good around the world. So if you go to East Asia, um, the stability the United States provides is quite important. Um, one of the challenges will be whether how other countries will share that load and responsibility. And this also goes back with some of the rising powers. This is something that people have discussions on in East Asia. And it's also a challenge for American diplomacy. So how we will be able to bring those countries and supporters into the system. Now you also asked for the costs and I guess, you know, of Iraq and Afghanistan. And I guess I would just summarize it by saying is huge. And so the uh, United States was attacked in 9-11, so that gives you a certain point on Afghanistan. But I think that in understanding the United States' ability to engage in conflicts, clearly it's not simply a cost-benefit calculation, as it wasn't in World War II. But one of the things that's affected people's attitudes is the ability to pay these costs in, in blood as well as money over time. And those are clearly factors that have to affect how uh, countries approach the security in war. I mentioned you know, the case of, of Great Britain in the Napoleonic Wars. You know, if you lose your credit and you lose your ability not only in, to have basic economic performance, but your ability as a country to innovate and sort of uh, play the role the United States has played, you will also affect the security system. So I don't think there's a formula you can provide on that. I, you know, and that's part of the democratic debate. I do believe that uh, the defense uh, sort of expenditures become very important and one, if you lose it, <laughs> it, it's going to be very, very hard to recover. But I also, look, I'm a fiscal conservative. I believe you shouldn't just throw money at problems. You ought to think about how to do it effectively. So uh, I want to take advantage of being a chair and ask you a quick question and then we'll have time for uh, one more question. And that is um, several times, because it hasn't been asked, several times in your talk you mentioned inclusive growth. Indeed, and I think the people that would be critical of some of the description of history, you would say, would say that some of the growth, especially in recent years, particularly within countries, has not been very inclusive. And the United States, the 1% group, and so forth. So what would a strategy that is, pays attention to inclusive growth, uh, your words, uh, look like? Well, it's interesting that you pose that because I, I was just in Singapore about a week ago, and they created a Singapore Economic Summit, and one of the panels was on this question of inclusive growth from an Asian context. And you, you put in a Philip there that I just want to draw out. You know, if we look at the overall international economic system, and you look at the reduction of poverty, a lot of it by China, but actually you've had it in, in all regions now, the World Bank data, Latin America, Africa, you had some very significant achievement, not to be underestimated. Um, within countries, I think, uh, is also a question of what people define as uh, their approach to inclusion. The approach that I take is trying to create a quality of opportunity, which is different than a quality of result. Um, and those are debatable points. Now, when you take quality of opportunity, however, one also has to recognize the disadvantages. What is an equal opportunity for people depending on their circumstance um, in terms of basic health, nutrition? Um, one of the lessons, and again, this is a wonderful ability for South-North learning as well as North-South, is this Opportunatus program I referred to. This does 15 to 20 percent of the population for a half of 1 percent of GDP. Maybe the U.S. could learn some things <laughs> in terms of effective safety net programs. So 
What I define as inclusive growth is the notion that uh, for the benefit of individuals, but also for the benefit of a cohesive society, and also for the benefit of a stronger country. You want to be able to draw from the contributions of, of all the people. Um, and that is a combination of interventions to give people a chance, but the government also has to be careful about the overregulation because what I've seen in other contexts is, is that the regulatory process can actually be taken over by those that are in the favored position. They're the ones with power. And so whether in some developing countries, oligarchies, oligopolies actually prevent the competition uh, that create sort of broader opportunities. Financial inclusion, I don't remember the exact numbers about this, but I think there's about oh, two and a half billion people in the world who don't have basic access to a bank account. This isn't just microcredit or remittance, the ability to have transfers. but where there's huge opportunities is take Sub-Saharan Africa and mobile telephones. About a decade ago, there were only about 10 million mobile telephones. Now there's about five to 600 million. And in terms of policy, remember everybody used to talk about the digital divide. In Sub-Saharan Africa, there's been over $70 billion of private investment in telecommunications by creating the right legal structures. So part of what I'm cautioning here is that in the effort to try to create inclusiveness, I think it's important to do so in a way that also doesn't undermine fundamental incentives in the system. I'm afraid this will have to be the last question. Uh, good evening. My name is Sarah Follet. I'm a freshman at the college. Uh, thank you very much for speaking with us today. I wanted to ask, how do you see the role of foreign economic aid in advancing U.S. foreign policy in today's international context, and particularly the Arab Spring? Okay. Um, well, this is just a cross-reference, but, but uh, it may be on the bank website or I dropped off a copy here. I actually I wrote a speech, uh, one of the last speeches I gave at the bank called Beyond uh, Aid. And, it, and I just referenced it to you because what I was partly trying to say is that there is no doubt there is an important role for foreign assistance to dealing with humanitarian problems that are going to exist for some countries that are broken. Um, but our real goal should be to look beyond aid, and the reason I emphasize that ties in a little bit with David's question, is it's not only a question of assistance policies. It's a question of trying to create an international economic environment. So are your own subsidies policies, whether your agricultural subsidies make it harder for others, whether your trade barriers make it harder for others. So you're trying to create an international economic system that moves away from dependency. And what I found in developing countries is People don't want to be treated as wards. They want to have a chance to grow. They want to have a chance to have added opportunities. So what it means in terms of, of kind of U.S. foreign assistance is I think over time that assistance should be related to creating the opportunity, the growth possibilities, and also sharing the information. And so, for example, you know, one of the things that President Bush did that was sort of sometimes recognized, perhaps not fully, but what he did in terms of HIV AIDS and malaria and trying to deal with basic disease connections is a partly of a game changer in sub-Saharan Africa. But you, you just can't stop with that. You have to then sort of build on the basic health and nutrition conditions going forward. Um, I, I believe there will always be a need in terms of humanitarian support. But even there, the types of things we were learning at the bank in terms of natural disasters, there's a lot you can do in terms of early warning, um, sort of the types of buildings and structures you do, and the quick response systems. And what was quite interesting about this is some of the lessons we learned from developing countries we were also sharing with Japan and Australia after some of theirs problems. So it again shows some of the interconnectivity of these issues overall. So I think that I guess the last point is in the foreign assistance debate in the United States, but it's true with all developed countries. There has to be a stronger focus on results. I mean, in a way, as I touched on, sometimes foreign assistance was seen as a trade for friends on security policy in the Cold War. What I found is to get support for, say, Great Britain, which has actually m maintained the goal of the 0 0.7 at a time that they're cutting the budget, you have to demonstrate good governance, fight against corruption, transparency, and rigor in results. And so there are a lot of things we were trying to do at the bank, but also it ultimately depends on developing countries 
to have a commitment to try to figure out what works and what doesn't. And you know, this is one of the other lessons of, of the broader development process, which is that people will often do things of good intentions, they're well-meaning, but if they don't work, we gotta learn the lessons so that we don't make those mistakes again. So I believe that from the political point of view, you can build support for these foreign assistance. And let me give you a practical example. Um, when I was president of the World Bank, we got the first recapitalization of the World Bank in over 20 years. So this is a time that the U.S. Congress is going through budget cutting, you know, whether Republican, this took Republicans and Democrats, it took authorized and appropriators, and part of this is to build support with different communities, to show, for example, that the World Bank was important with American security interests in Afghanistan or Africa or Haiti or Liberia, to show the importance of emerging markets as potential buyers. So over the past 10 years, U.S. exports have gone from about 25 or 30 percent to emerging markets to 50 percent. So these are your markets of growth of the future. And then also um, the religious community. The religious community in the United States is very important on some of the basic humanitarian and development options. So as a, as a political figure, you partly put together coalitions, and you put together coalitions of multiple interests. So I'm not saying that it's an easy process, but I do think that uh, it can be done and it's worth doing if it's connected ultimately to the goal of trying to help countries stand on their own two feet. Thank you very much, Robert. Appreciate it. Thank you all for coming and have a very safe and one, a good evening. Thank you.